So is phase important in the Fourier transform? And we often see in textbooks that only the amplitude of the Fourier transform is plotted. So is phase really important? Let's look at this example. It's a very common example of a square pulse shape in the time domain. And I think uh, it's well understood that the Fourier transform of this is a sync function. And if you need more information on this, there's a video on the channel uh, about the relationship between the square pulse in the time domain and the Fourier transform being a sync function. So this sync function, if the base of the time uh, is t, uh, then the first null in the Fourier domain, in the frequency domain, is 2 pi divided by capital T, if this is the uh, angular frequency. Okay, so we're familiar with this, and the height of this is capital T. Uh, again, look in the links below this video for links to uh, that uh, video that explains this in more detail. So let's think about, uh, uh, and so to say here, um, if you were interested, for example, in the bandwidth, so this was a digital pulse, and we were interested in the bandwidth that was occupied, then yes, I think plotting the amplitude is probably what you're most interested in, and this is what's most commonly done. So the main lobe of the bandwidth would be uh, here at, coming down at 2 pi on t, uh, and of course you've got side lobes going out further from that. Uh, now let's look at another waveform, and I'm going to plot this one down here. And this one is a waveform which is twice as long. So it's the same square waveform, but it's now twice as long. And what happens to that? Well, I think, again, uh, it's if this is 2t, then expansion in the time domain gives us compression in the frequency domain. And also, it gives us an amplitude scaling. So now uh, we've got this here, it's a sync function that is half the width, and again, uh, this is well understood and, and you'll find that plotted in many textbooks. Uh, so expansion in the time gives compression in the frequency. So this is all uh, what people commonly would be thinking about. Now let's, let me raise something with you that might get you thinking. So what about this pulse shape here? Well this pulse shape is also a pulse which is of width capital T. And so this pulse shape also has a sync amplitude spectrum that is the sync function with the width 2 pi divided by t. And so these two pulse shapes are both of the same width and they both in the frequency domain, they both have the same magnitude spectrum, both sync functions. And again, if we come back to our digital example, again, this all uh, makes intuitive sense. Uh, this data here is being sent at a lower data rate because you're spending more time sending the one or the zero. And because it's at a lower data rate, you need less bandwidth. So this is why we're comfortable with this coming in at pi divided by capital T. So I think all of this makes sense. Uh, we start to think, well, what's going on here? These two different functions have the same Fourier transforms, or at least it looks like they do, because we're only plotting the amplitude. And this is where we come to our question, is phase important? Another thing to think about uh, is that, well, the addition of these two waveforms in the time domain gives us this waveform here. So this plus this gives us this. And because we have linearity in the Fourier transform relationship, that also means that this plus this equals this. And I think this is where you really start thinking, if you're not aware of the phase, and if you're only thinking about the magnitudes, this is where you'd start to scratch your head and think, well, hang on, what's going on here? Because these are definitely, you can see that the addition of these two definitely gives you this waveform. Um, but we've already said, okay, we feel comfortable that this waveform is a lower rate waveform, lower changing speed, so it needs to have less bandwidth. But then we look at these pictures and we think, well, how can it be that the addition of these two gives us this one? Because this has still got quite a bit of amplitude out here, as does this one, and yet this amplitude has already come down to its first null. And so if you're only thinking of the amplitude and if you're not thinking about the phase, then this would be definitely something that is confusing. So let's look into this in a bit more detail. In fact, it is of course true, this plus this does equal this once you take the phase into account. So let's have a look at this. 
Um, so let's look at the, the equation uh, that you'll find on many formula sheets, that in the time domain, if you have the rect function, uh, then the Fourier transform is the as a sine omega divided by omega relationship. So it's a sinc function. If we look at this exact rect function, this one is the function which is a square pulse, just like this one. It's of width capital T, just like this one, except it is centered at zero. That's what the definition of rect is. So if you have a square function centered at zero, then the Fourier transform is exactly this sinc function, and this is a real valued function. There's no imaginary component to this function. And so then you could plot the amplitude spectrum of this by just simply plotting this function and you would have the full information. Um, there is no, uh, there's no uh, imaginary component here, so there's no real concept of a phase for this because it's just the real. So now let's think, well, what's the difference between this function and the one I've plotted here? So let's look at some of the properties. So if you do a time shift on a uh, time domain waveform, then you have exactly the Fourier transform of the original function, but you get this component here, which is a phase shift. And this is where we're seeing the phase that's being important. So this function up here is actually, so if this is x of t is a rect, then this function up here is actually x of t minus capital T divided by 2. That's what that function is. So this function is actually e to the minus j omega of capital T divided by 2 times x of omega. Okay, now <clears throat> this is a, a function here where the amplitude of this exponential, the modulus of this is 1. So the, when you plot the amplitude spectrum, and now we can see what we're doing is we're plotting here the amplitude or the magnitude of the Fourier transform, because the Fourier transform has a phase component because of the time shift. So even this one has a phase component, which we don't see when we plot the magnitude, because the magnitude of that component is 1. Now the same thing here, this one here, this one is x of t minus 3t divided by 2. So again, this function here is e to the minus j omega 3t divided by 2 times x of omega. With, and we're plotting again the magnitude. And this one here, well, what's this one? This one is x of t divided by 2 because there's a time expansion here of capital T divided by 2. So this, this function here, the third one, is the first one with a time expansion. And you do that by replacing the t with t divided by 2 because we expanded it by a factor of 2. So now this function here is e to the minus j omega 3t, uh, sorry, e to the minus j omega of t, um, uh, with a 2 because we've got uh, another property here. Let's look at this property. So if you do a time expansion here, then you get the Fourier transform with a scaling of omega. You got omega divided by a and an amplitude scaling here out the front of 1 divided by the mod of a. So here a equals 2. So we're going to have 2 out the front of e to the minus j omega t times x of 2 omega because a uh, equals one half for us. Okay, so this is, uh, and again, we're plotting the mo the modulus. So again, if you're only looking at the magnitude, then you would be confused as to why this plus this equals this. But once you write out what the actual equations are, you see that each one of these is actually a time-shifted version of a rect, which is centered at zero. And so each one of these has a phase shift, which we're not seeing when we only plot the magnitude. So let's look at those phase shifts to try to understand them more, to understand why this plus this equals this. So let me plot the, the phase now for the first function here. So this phase, and we, we always, we know that, let me draw a circle here just to remind ourselves that we know that if this is the zero phase here in the real, this is the real, this is the imaginary. Uh, and so when we, we measure phase around in this direction, then a positive pi phase, this is pi phase, is the same as a negative pi phase. So it repeats around the circle. So we always plot our phases, where we're doing this as a function of omega, we always plot our phases between positive pi and negative pi. And we're going to do the same when we do it for this one. So let me do it for this one here. The phase is 
uh, from here, the so phase of this is omega times capital T divided by 2. And this, we're plotting it as a function of omega. So this is what we call linear phase. So as omega increases, the phase increases linearly because it's omega times capital T divided by 2. So let's see what, uh, what that phase uh, angle is here. So if we had omega equals 2 pi on T, for example, then we've got uh, the phase is going to be 2 pi on T. Here we are, 2 pi on t times, we put that in here, then the t's cancel and the pi's can, uh, the 2's the cancel and you're left with negative pi. So at this value here, it's negative pi. And this is a linear straight line phase here uh, as a function. So we've got this as the amplitude spectrum and this is the phase spectrum. Okay, uh, now let's look at this one here to try to understand the relationship and how this plus this could equal this. Well, let's look at this one. The phase here is three times that slope. So it's a much uh, faster slope. And so two thirds of the way between zero and pi on t, it's going to get to minus pi. And so that's this value here. And then when it gets to minus pi, which is the height of that, then it flips to positive pi because minus pi is the same as positive pi. And so we draw that up here um, and this goes at the same slope and gets at pi on t, it gets to a value of pi on 2. Okay, so and of course it keeps going uh, down until it gets to negative uh, pi. Okay, and the same thing happens on this side here, uh, where this goes down to the negative and it goes up here to be negative pi. So this is the phase, the linear phase of, uh, of this second function, which is shifted by more. Now let's look, just to be an interest, let's look at this point here of pi on capital T. Can it really be true that this plus this equals zero? Uh, this is obviously not zero, that's obviously not zero. How does the result equal zero? Well, we, as we say, let's look at the phase. So this is at pi on t. So at pi on t here, the phase is negative pi on two. Okay, and at pi on t here, the phase equals pi on two. So here we've got for the top function, which we've shifted only here by, pi on, oh, by capital T on two, we've got a phase of negative pi on two. So on this picture here, that's this point here. And for the other one, which we shifted by more, the phase at pi on t is positive pi on two. And that's this point here. And so you can see that those two points are on the opposite sides of the complex circle, the unit circle. So when we add those two together, if they have the same magnitude, which they do, when we add them together, the phases will cancel exactly, and because they had the same magnitude, they will exactly cancel each other out and we'll get zero. So hopefully by looking at the phase uh, and by understanding that when you're looking at these plots, which are commonly the only thing plotted in textbooks, you're really only seeing half the picture. These plots show you the magnitude, but when you want to understand how, for example, a broadband digital signal, which is across a broadband, if you add two of them together and you get a less broadband signal, a, half that band, a signal that has half that bandwidth, how does it make sense that in the time domain you can see that they add together to give this slower rate signal, but in the frequency band it doesn't look like you can. It only, you only understand that they do when you understand the phase. So hopefully this example has given you more insights into the, the role of phase in the Fourier transform. And really the answer to this is that yes, the phase is always important in the Fourier transform. If you found the video useful, please give it a thumbs up. It helps others to find the video. Uh, check out the link in the details below the video where there's a web page with a full categorized list of all the videos on the channel. And subscribe to the channel for more videos.